very appropriate for our message today because Samson was like a poster child for falling away. Next slide. I'll explain and read our scripture right off the bat and get that going. Samson had a problem, and this verse probably verses probably pointed out pretty correctly. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does not who he who does the will of God abides forever. The word of God and the people of God. Praise be to God. Let's have a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for just the fact that you still love us in spite of our fact that we do chase the world at times and we do things we shouldn't. And Lord, just help us to not be fallen. Help us to raise us up, Lord. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. So it's interesting that Samson is in this list in the Hall of Faith, which I've been going through back and forth to. We, uh, in Hebrews 11, we've been through this a couple times, but we're kind of at the end, and I think when I finish Samson, we'll be done with it. But um, it's crazy to me that Samson's even in the list of people that God would count as faithful. Of course, I don't. I, we're human. We don't look at things the way God does. But I'll read you the verses. Uh, I'll just start at verse 32 in chapter 11 of Hebrews. It says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. In case you hadn't figured it out, we just did all those guys. We're up to Samson now. And also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. So that's that's all of us. I mean, that, that story is our story too, but when I think back through this and think about Gideon, Gideon was so weak and God used him and raised him up. And Samson, man, Samson was called and set apart from the get-go, and he fought it his whole life. And I, and, I, and I don't know if that speaks to anybody here, that the fact that, that God has tried to use you your whole life, it speaks to me, struck, speaks volumes to me. And so when I'm preaching today, I'm preaching to, to myself, as always. But um, we're going to be in chapter 13 and I don't know that we'll get beyond chapter 14 today this it's Samson gets really what I consider the most press in the book of Judges so God must want us to hear his story he must want us to see how he lives he must want us to understand something about him and I think he's the example of what not to do and sometimes our lives can preach a sermon the other way right this is not what you do it's not how you should live and, that, and I think that's Samson Gideon is kind of the reverse of that. And he is one that was weak and hesitant. But in the end, when he finally got some comfort with what God was calling him to do, he, he did what he was supposed to do. He stood up and he took the he took on a role that you never thought this meek and mild man would take. So it's such a juxtaposition. Um, it's interesting, if you look across the book of Judges, and you, they always, the, the Israelites are always falling away. In other words, they're always going back to, to worshiping the other gods and living lives that God would not like or, or, or would approve of. And it's, all, it's kind of crazy because if we go back to Gideon, if I remember right, Gideon was supposed to, um, in his generation, they, uh, they worshiped God and Yahweh both. Then when we got to Jephthah, they no longer worship God, but in all those cases before, in other words, they worship, they never worship God, they only worship the, the other idols. But in all those cases before, they cried out to God. What's so crazy about the story of Samson, they didn't even cry out to God at all. They no longer worshiped him at all, they only worshiped the other gods, and now they didn't even cry out to him. This is the story of us if we went on the wrong path. First, we try to replace God with something else. But we, when we struggle and fail, then we reach out to God, and he helps us. 
But then there's the next level. We struggle and we fail and we don't reach out to God. And I see that every day with people because they're angry with God of how their life is going, how their world is living. I think about that. It's this, so it's like the book of Judges is this, this long, drawn-out picture of what Christian life could look like and how badly it could go if we don't serve the Lord who loves us and we don't walk in His ways and we aren't who He called us to be. And so Samson is this crazy example of God using someone to do something He called them to do regardless of whether they're going to do it or not. He still accomplished what He wanted to accomplish with Samson in spite of how He lived. And He died a horrible, violent, early death and he could have lived for God and been one of the greatest men of the Bible. But he was a, a great, he was, he was a man of great strength, but he was not a great man. Do you kind of get that? He was a man of tremendous capability, but he was not a great man. So it's kind of crazy to me that he's in the hall of faith and you think about that. But anyway, we'll go to his story. And we'll start off with, uh, and I guess... I, I, I made myself just quickly notes when I walked in here this morning, um, just so you might understand it. Okay, he was God, and I'll read it in just a second. But God chose him to be a Nazarite, and a Nazarite was someone who was set apart and holy, and and, and I won't say monk-like, but he had a he had a lifestyle that was supposed to do certain things, and there was only three rules for a Nazarite, and they were no haircut ever. Robert, um, uh, never, never touch anything unclean, particularly like a dead body. That was the second one. And the third one was no alcohol. So pretty short set of rules. Now you're supposed to live for God, but those were the things that set you apart. Those were the things that made you different. You didn't, you didn't ever cut your hair. So it was obvious to people, hey, that guy's a Nazarite. So we probably ought to cut him some slack. He's not going to do certain things because he's not going to touch a dead body. He's not going to. He's not going to live a wild, frivolous life. He's going to have a certain walk, and he's not. You know, so people would know who you were. And then the last thing was no alcohol. Well, Samson never ever followed those rules. From the moment he was born and set aside, he never followed them. Now think about that. God calls you through your parents, through a miraculous birth, and you never do it. Isn't that crazy? That's absolutely crazy to think about. Um, so what I want to talk about, and, it, and, and, and I may never get anything done today as far as on the sermon. God put something on my heart last night, and, and, it, and it's not to pick on people. I have a lot of friends that are uh, in drug addiction and all that. And there was a great, there was a Crowder concert last night in Jonesboro. Uh, and, uh, and it, it supported addiction recovery homes and all. And I have a lot of people I know that even invited us to go. I had too much going on. You guys know I work and got stuff to do. But so I didn't get to go. But and they're going to watch this video. I'm going to get from them. But this is preaching to me. The thing they did most of the night at the concert was take selfies of themselves at the concert to show what they were doing. If you're truly praising and worshiping God, then you're not going to be focused on what you're doing. Got me? You're not going to be pointing to you. And that's that was kind of the thing that, you know, I, I get it. Hey, I got to go to a concert. It's a good concert, and, you know, and I get all that. But it's it's our culture, and it's Samson's problem, too. He, 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 everything was about himself. And and one of the things that, that I want us to do as a church, and I'm trying hard to kind of push us that direction, is I want us to worship God the way He wants us to worship God. And a lot of people think that worship is strictly music. Now, music is a part of it. But worship is your life. If you're a, if you're a child of God, worship is everything you do every minute of every day. It is not just when you're in church on Sunday morning for an hour. It is everything you do. And Jesus doesn't have much to say about worship, except at one point, it's about... Um, He's talking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, I believe. And she starts asking questions because I think she's of she's of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or she's of Samaritan, I can't remember. But at that point in time, the Pharisees believed you would worship in one place on a mountaintop, and the Sadducees believed you would worship in the temple. And those are the two places. And so when she asked Jesus the question, he basically answered and said, It's not about where you worship. It's how you worship. 
And he basically said that anywhere that you are with me or you pray to me, you're worshiping. Okay, so, so we get that, right? It's not necessarily in church. But the most important thing he said was how to worship. And he said you worship in spirit and in truth. And when I think about that, spirit, that's here. Truth is here. It takes both. We need the Holy Spirit in us. And, and, and the other piece of that is, believe it or not, you cannot worship God if you're not saved. Because he said you worship in spirit. So when do you get the spirit? When you're saved. So you cannot worship God unless you're saved. That's a harsh statement, but it's truth. So, he's, so your heart has to be right. You have to have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have to love God. He has to be the thing you live for. But then the second part of that is your, your brain, your truth. You read the God's Word. You put it up here. It's, when you, it's your index. It's what you go to when things go wrong. It's, your, it's how you live. It's how you believe and all those things. And in and, and our story today, this man is so far from that. It's crazy. But when I watched those friends of mine doing all that at the concert, were they worshiping in spirit and truth if they were more worried about their friends seeing them at a concert? That's what I'm saying. Where is your focus when you're here? What, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you looking to God? Are you looking for Him to, to work on you and reveal something to you and change you? That, that, you know, that, what are you doing? And what do you do every day of your life? So that's, the, and so it's interesting to me, if you go back to Exodus and you, and you listen to the story of Moses and he's trying to get the, the Israelites, do you remember what the original reason was to get the people separated away from Israel? Just, and it just was just for a moment. It wasn't permanent. He said, so we can go out and worship God. That was the reason they were to go out and worship. Because that was the whole point of him asking Pharaoh, if you just let us go out and worship, then we'll come back and we'll go to work. And of course, Pharaoh said, no, I can't do that. That was a battle. But do you understand how important worship is to God? How important it is in our lives? And so, so when you think about why God calls people, and why God uses people. And you look at the story of Samson, you think about how the fact that he, he was a person who, who was called to worship God every moment of his life. He was going to be this great example, and yet he never did anything. So I just, I kind of wanted to leave that in. I mean, the reason God would bring people away from, in the judge's situation, when he would bring them out from those other people, the reason he brought them to the promised land, the reason they were supposed to run everybody out and not take on those cultures was so they could worship God. So they wouldn't be doing all that other stuff. So I just want you all to think about that. You know, why are you here? Who do you love? And what rules your life? Those are the questions that we all have to ask. And so if, if you can't separate yourself like Samson couldn't, if you only worry about the things of this world, if you only worry about what everybody else thinks, then you're not worshiping God. And so the second problem that, that, uh, that I want to talk about is what uh, Samson had an eye problem, and it fits in the same situation. And it's the, the letter I and the E-Y-E I. Samson, and this, here we go. Samson always was about himself. The eye, the regular eye. But the EYE problem he had was everything he saw, he wanted. He lusted after the things of this world. So he had a both problem. The eye problem was the heart, the spirit problem. It was all about himself, it wasn't there. But the other problem, the, I, the other EYE problem, was because he looked at the world and his brain wasn't wired right. It wasn't in the Holy Spirit land, it was, it was all about what do I need? What are I, you know, he, he had lusts. So that whole spirit and truth thing just missed him all together. He had, he had no chance with the way he lived. And so his, his story is very horrible with a horrible ending, but we're going we're gonna to start off with his birth. And um, I think about um, the fact that in the, in the Old Testament, he's only like the second person, maybe the third. There's another one with Hannah. Uh, but you've got the birth of Isaac which is foretold. And Isaac was, was a uh, situation where an per older person was barren and they had a child and, and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. And, uh, and you had a situation where that person was set apart to be actually one of the patriarchs of the church. And, and you just, you know, 
And in that case, he followed through. You had this miraculous birth of somebody who was destined to do great things. And remember, John the Baptist was the same way. And then Jesus Christ himself was a birth that was announced and foretold, and, and, and it was set aside. And, and, of course, you could almost say, well, here's Jesus over here, and this is his life, and here's Samson. And what, what, we're just polar opposites. But the beginning is the same. They were called and set apart and, and set up to be. So here's, here's the story of Samson, starting in chapter 13. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man of, from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was, was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child who shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver the Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. I'm going to stop right there. By the way, the Nazarite vow was typically any time from one month to a year. It's kind of like, I'm going to commit myself to God, and I'm going to live like this for a time. Well, God called this person to be a Nazarite for his entire life. I don't think he made a month, but I'm saying he, he was called to be that. So in, in the Old Testament, there were people from time to time who would like, I'll do a month, I'll do three months, I'll do six months, I'll do a year. That's my vow to God, and that's how I'm going to live. And I guess we could see that. I'm going I'm to go through a time of spiritual renewal. I'm going to go on some sort of retreat, I'm gonna, you know, and I'm going to come out of that, and I'm going to live a certain way, and I'm going to try to go above and beyond. We, we all, I think, it, it, it can realize that and see that. But the thing is, God called Samson to do that. 100% of the time for his entire life. Like I say, he failed miserably. So the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. By the way, they believe that this is a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ coming to, to see all these judges. When they say the angel of the Lord, he looked like a man, he talked to him. They actually believe this was Jesus actually prior to his coming. And he said to him, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, now drink no wine, or some drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be born Nazareth to God from the womb in the day of his death, till the day of his death. So he was a Nazareth to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, please let the man of God whom you sent me um, um, come again and teach us what we shall do for the child who thus will be born. Okay, so the parents actually asked, how am I going to raise a Nazarite? What do I do? Now, they've all been living in this crazy culture where they don't even hardly know what being a Jewish person is. And so the parents actually say, okay, we need some help. You need to come back and tell us how to do that. So the angel comes back and he gives them the whole spiel on how to raise a Nazarite kid. So I guess I could say, well, that's kind of like Sunday school and all that stuff. How do you, how do you raise a kid to be who you want him to be? So we're going to jump through all of that and jump to chapter 14. And we're going to jump right into, and by the way, they don't call the wife's name in that story, but Mrs. Manoah, I'll call her that because she didn't have a name, she was way more theologically in tune with what God was trying to do than, than Papa was. He was just confused. But she kind of ran the show and kept everything going. You can read chapter, all of chapter 13 to get that. But chapter 14 is when we begin Samson's journey in life. And... Uh, it's crazy because he has the Spirit of the Lord in him that gives him strength, but yet he lives this life. I, I struggle with understanding it personally, but anyway. So now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughter of the Philistines. Now number one, he was not supposed to touch anything unclean. He was really supposed to live an almost monastic life and stay home and, do, and, and, and save his own people. So now he's going down to the waterfront the riverfront in Little Rock, we'll call it like that. And he's going to go down there and he's going to party and he's going to find him, this woman and he's going to bring her home. Now how far away is, from, is that from living what he's called to live? I mean, everything about it is opposite of what he's supposed to do. He says, so he went up and he told his father, and by the way, they had arranged marriages in those days, so girls, you basically just picked your wife out of the crowds. I want that one over there. And you made it, made it happen, so... 
probably pretty interesting. I, I could see that with my wife. It'd be dangerous, but anyway. Uh, so he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I've seen a woman in, in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. So this guy, this man, he, he's like, he's a, he, she was cute, whatever. He, he gets what he wants. He lives his whole life about what he wants. What is going to meet my needs? What's going to fulfill what I need? That's what I want. That's all I want. I don't care about anything else. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren and among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines, which was a no-no? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. So he didn't care. He didn't care about anything. He didn't care about what his parents thought. But his father and mother did not know that it was all of the Lord. Here's the story. Throughout this whole thing, God's hand, his sovereignty, is driving the ship. So yeah, he's going down there and he's a sinner and he's doing all these bad things. But God's putting him in a position where he's going to battle the very people that are keeping them in oppression. So.